Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again to As I Live and Grieve. This is the second part of an episode we did a few weeks ago called The Adoption Triad. And we're coming back for a second part because today we actually have the complete triad. That means we have someone who was adopted as a child. We have someone who adopted a child or children. And then we have the biological mother, the birth mother of someone who gave up her child for adoption. These are not all the same child. So I want you to know that. So again, welcome. With me today, I have an abundance of people with me and I love it. With me are Pat, Vera, Tina. So one by one, I'm just going to ask each of you to say hi. Vera, say hi. Hi, everybody. (laughs) Tina. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about the adoption triad. Okay, the adoption triad, there are three components. And if I think of the situation of adoption in connection with grief, the first thing I think of and the most prominent aspect of it that I think of is the biological mother and that myriad of emotions that must have been felt, and I'm only guessing because I have not experienced it myself, that myriad of emotions that are felt when you are faced with and you make a decision of this caliber. We learned in our last episode, though, that there is grief present in the other two components of the triad as well. So as a way to catch up, first you might want to listen to the other episode, because right now I'm going to start with Pat. Pat, You've agreed to be here today, and I appreciate it so much because I know this was not an easy time in your life. Regardless of the reasons for your decision, can you kind of explain how grief played a part in your life after the decision was made? Well, once uh, I had the child, and I'd made the decision before that, and it was back in the 60s, so things were a little different then compared to what they are now. But the, you know, but the fact that you have relinquished a child and you don't know if you're ever going to see that child again, you were told you weren't going to. It's just such an emptiness and you're sort of numb. There was no counseling back in those days. You were just told that you did the right thing. Just forget about it and move on and you try to do that but you know physically you're in pain from having had the child and if you've ever had a child all the emotional things that go along with it as well and it's just uh it's just it's hard to describe what that feeling really is but you right you you take the next step forward but I would say that the grief and the emptiness never goes away. You just sort of had to put it on the shelf and move on. Yeah, I was I was going to to say almost exactly that in fact. And you you mentioned the emptiness. That's probably one of the best words I can think of that might describe it um is that emptiness. And I was going to ask you in fact Did it ever go away? The answer to that is no. Did it lessen at all? Did it change at all? It never lessened. That part always kind of stays the same. But you do have to move on, just like everything else. You have to move forward. You can't stay there forever. So it depends on your next step. You know, I was, and no one knew. So it was just, it was just myself and my friend that I had lived with and her husband. That was basically it. They were the only okay. people that knew. So there was no one I could come back to to talk about it with. And back then, you didn't oh talk goodness. about things like that, just like every other no. thing that happened to your life that was grief-related. You, you didn't talk right. about those things. You just stuffed them. And, no. um, you know, you just went on, come back, 
I had to get a job. I had to like start over again. And um, yeah. but you don't ever forget that, right? And I think it it must hurt even more knowing that you can't share it. And the reason I say that is because with the losses I've had in my life, it brings me a little bit of comfort, for example, to mention my late husband's name or to share a memory of him with people. But you didn't even have the ability or advantage or privilege of doing that. This was a stuff it in the closet, move forward, never speak of it again. Exactly. I am so, so sorry that you had to endure that. Now, did there come a time, a point, did you know your child had been adopted? Did you get any communication? Um, Actually, uh, my adoption was a private adoption. I did not go through an agency. But no, I never knew. All I knew is that he was being adopted in uh, by a family in Texas and that they were professionals. Okay. And no, I never, back then, they were closed adoptions. No, the adoptive parents didn't ever okay. have to share anything. And as a young uh, okay. woman who's really pushed a child, nobody ever told you what maybe some of your rights might have been at that time you know maybe there's something else that could have happened but nobody really told you much of anything back then all right oh gosh this is hard it's hard for me to talk about it it must be really really difficult for you to kind of relive it in this conversation again thank you have you had any communication with your child in 2009 i my friend that i had lived with when I was pregnant and had him, received a letter from him, and he was looking for me. So in 2009, we reunited, and he was 44 years old at the time. Wonderful. And wow, I have been married, and I had three more children, but nobody ever knew. My husband knew, but no one else ever knew. So this okay. was, All right. I was surprised. But I was so happy. I it was always oh, something good. that I wanted, and I just thought when he when he was eighteen, he would be able to go to the courthouse, get his adoption records, get my name, and find me. Right. I did not know that original birth certificates are sealed when their adoption is final, and they get amended birth certificates. Thank goodness. So. I don't think the general public even knows today that when a child is adopted, their original birth certificate is sealed and they do not have access to it unless they go through the court. That's changing in a lot of states now. Uh, Minnesota just passed the law last year. So in Minnesota, on July 1st, 2024, adoptees can now go and get their original birth certificate and their names should be on there, but not rarely are the birth father's names on there. And that's sort of true in a lot of states. So that's changing in Minnesota. So uh, there's Uh only 15 states where you have open uh, where adoptees can go and get their original birth certificate. And the one thing, that's a very important piece of paper. That yes. validates who you are, and adoptees want that validation. Right, right. Goodness, goodness. Well, congratulations, Minnesota, and to the other states that are loosening things up. Now, Tina, you were adopted as a child, yeah. and our listeners, of course, couldn't see this, but as Pat was speaking and talking about the sealed birth certificates, you were nodding your head. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to say about this? Well, uh, by the time that I can get my original birth certificate, I will be almost 65 years old. And so I have been, I've been doing this my whole life since I was about 17 searching and I have been reunited with my birth mother, although it's not a, a very good situation. And when I, uh, w- when I read about this, when I saw this was going to change in Minnesota, I just can't even explain what that meant to me that finally somebody was saying, it's okay if you have your own 
birth certificate. Right. Because right. I've never been able to see it. I have seen very little of my adoption papers. The one thing I wanted to add to what Pat said is, while original birth certificates will be available as of July 1st in Minnesota, we still cannot get access to our adoption records because they are sealed for 100 years. And so I may be able to get my original birth certificate, but I only have the front page of my adoption record, which states my name. And so I already know my birth name, but it, it's hard to explain when you've gone your whole life seeing false information, knowing that it's not real, knowing that your birth record was sealed and that your adopted parents are now listed as your birth parents. And so I, I'm elated. I, I cannot wait. I'm very excited about this. I don't expect that there will be much information on there that will be useful to me since I have already uh, found my birth mother. And I doubt that she listed my birth father. Uh, like Pat said, during the 60s, that just wasn't done. Right, and right. so uh, we'll see what happens. But I am extremely excited about this. And I hope to <laughs> I hope to spread the word and tell every adoptee I know in Minnesota that, you know, this is happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm horrified that... <laughs> I really am. I'm horrified that this information would be kept private from the very person it impacts the most. Yeah, it, it is horrifying. It is. Vera, you adopted children. Come on. you Right. Well, in. the weirdest thing about this is, you know, Russia is, I mean, that's where my kids came from. And it is like closed, right? Tina's tried to like go through those barriers over there. You you can't get in, right? But the one thing they really do give you is the original birth certificate. I mean, it is in Russian. It is oh, for it is sakes. authentic and um but there's no time of birth, which is hard if you're trying to get their astrology charts done. <laughs> but it does have right, dates and right. dates and, and all that. But so I just find that fascinating that Russia gives you that much information. But of course when you come here then with them. You want to get their, you know, social security cards and their, you know, passports and all that. And that's just a nightmare when you bring these documents into, you know, the DMV. Like it's always, every time they have to get something renewed or, you know, started a new school, it was always like, oh God, here we go. Here we, we go gotta again, go through right? with these, you know, yeah. these original birth certificates again, and nobody knows what to right. do. And right. so it's almost like, let's go, let's try again tomorrow. Maybe there'll be somebody else at the DMV that'll understand what to do. You <laughs> oh know, I mean, oh. <laughs> so that's always a little oh, trauma. But yeah, we do, we yeah. do have those, but that's about it. And the names of the birth parents and, and their heights. Um, and I think eye color, hair color, but that's it. That is okay. it. But they also have the name of the father. Yes. But again, like Tina and Pat have said, you know, you just don't know. You yeah, don't know. Yeah. Very good. Very right. true. Very true. Okay. And now to catch the conversation up, Pat offered some of her feelings and emotions about grief in relation to her perspective on the triad. Let's go back to Tina. And when we talked last time, I'd like you to just kind of recap about what types of grief related emotions you had being adopted as a child. What were you grieving and well, still actually are grieving? Yes. Uh, well, so many layers. I mean, that's the, that's the best word I can come up with because the very first layer is finding out you're adopted. And sort of disbelief, but also grief because it's a big, it's the abyss. You have no idea where you came from, who you were, who your parents were. Um, it, it's kind of scary in a way because, you know, I was adopted at nine months and I know that I was in uh, foster care through Catholic Charities. And I have one picture of myself when I was, I want to say five months old, maybe. And it was taken by a foster parent. And then I have no other pictures until I'm nine months old and I was adopted. And so you're, it's a grief that is so linked with the unknown and sadness. And it, it's really hard to describe. But, uh, and then over the years, 
you know, as I came into my teenage years and I realized that I, this was information I had to know and I really wanted to search. Then the grief came because my birth mother, or I'm sorry, my adoptive mother was so against it. And she was pretty mad actually that I wanted to pursue this. And I tried to convince her that it really had nothing to do with her. It was just me trying to figure out who yeah. I am, where I came from. Right, and, right. uh, and she just fought me every step of the way. And so uh, there was another layer of grief. Sure. I just thought, you know, I need your help. I don't need your anger. I need your help right. in this. Right. But she always perceived it as a betrayal or as a threat. I see. Um, okay. And so, you know, I guess for me, the main grief is the abyss. It's just not okay. knowing where you came from, who you are, yeah. or what your yeah. ethnicity is, what your yeah. ancestors were. I mean, it's it's really a big black hole. And uh, sure. I think that's kind of what you carry, what I carry anyway yeah. for many, yeah. many years. Okay. Um, and Vera, from your corner of the triad here, I kind of recall that we talked about two different components that as the mother of as the mother of adopted children you may also be grieving the life that you originally thought you were going to have but couldn't for whatever reason as well you're trying to help your adopted children now deal with their grief so you've got all of these layers and layers tina is a great word so vera how about some of your perspective yeah layers is a perfect it's a perfect way because you're, you know, here you're the mom and you're dealing with your own. And it's, you know, for me, I didn't need, I didn't have this need to have a child like through my body. I guess I was just one of those people. Adoption came very right. quickly for me and my husband. We didn't feel like we wanted right. to do in vitro and all that. Um, so, you know, we uh -huh. kind of went in it with, you know, like sighted. Um, and then you realize, whoa, <laughs> you know, there's a lot more going on here because they're grieving. Clearly there's something going on with them. And then, like I said, there's kind of this birth mom component that you're right. always kind of dealing with. And so right. it's it, when they're angry at you, sometimes the anger is really at, at her. And sure. You kind of, sure. And the mom gets it the worst. I don't know why, but I, dads just seem to be out of the picture in a lot of ways. I don't know what it is, but the, it's like the mom thing. The birth mom and the adoptive yeah. mom kind of going at it in a weird subconscious way, even though I yeah, was very yeah. open um, for them to know uh, about her and, and all yeah. that. But yeah, it, I think a lot of times it's for me, it's because the kids are so assured and sure of the love that their mom has for them, that they know that they can lash out and that love will still be there. That is true. They know that they will be forgiven. So I think that's. Because moms always get the worst of anyway. All. I yes, you know, and now bring in. I just see it happen day in and day a phantom out. Phantom birth mom, you know, yeah. like so. What like one of my if you know if yeah, yeah one of my ahead. daughters made a joke like they have like the name of their birth dad, but she was just like made this off cuff joke. She's like maybe Putin's my dad. Who knows, you know? And I thought, mm. <laughs> you know, like it's still not real. There's still there's a name and all that, but it's still not real. And like Tina said, right. it's the abyss. It could be anybody, right. you know. It could be anybody, really, yeah. if you yeah, really good. think about it. Yeah. Um, you wow. know, and the, and wow. then I wanted to also bring up, um, and I'm and I'm blown away that the, the media has not tapped into this, but like with the Brad Pitt situation with Brad Pitt and Angelina yes. Jolie. If you follow that, and I've been following it because I'm very interested, is they cr wanted to create this family, right? These international children with birth children and just kind of throw them all together. Yeah. Well, if you've noticed, when they got divorced, first of all, there was some something that went on with the adoptive son on a plane. It was physical, which, you know, my, my gut was there was something, some attachment issue going on, perhaps. Um, and they were having a fight, you know, like trying to contain him. Maybe the child, right. I don't know. But the three adopted children want nothing to do with him. They have completely uh, dropped him as a dad. One has changed her name, taken away her name. And the birth children are basically looking at it as my parents are divorced. So I just think yeah. that compounded, like, to me, yeah. it seems like they're really, again, feeling 
betrayed, abandoned, and right. the anger right. that is coming out of those two. Like one posted all kinds of horrible things about Brad Pitt. And the Hollywood community is all like, what? What? Brad's amazing, you know? And I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. Like, you have no go. idea yeah. the kind of anger these kids hold. Yeah. And yeah. it's not about you necessarily, Brad. It's a lot of layers. And in the media, no one's touched it. Like no one, no expert has come in. Nobody's talking about it. And to me, it's so yeah. obvious. Reach out to them <laughs> and tell them your perspective. <laughs> Perhaps. Right. Right about yeah, it. Yeah, I feel it bad for Brad in a way because I think he's getting a, a bad rap, rep because of it. Wow. Okay, I'm going to circle back now to Pat. Now that you have heard Tina and Vera's comments and perspectives, do you have anything you'd like to add from your Well, corner? the one thing I want to say is that I know that all adoptees wonder why their mother didn't keep them or their birth parents didn't keep them and right most birth mothers birth parents i'll say birth parents but they really never wanted to relinquish their children and so many uh women were underage and their parents really made the decision and so uh, adoptees just want to know their story. They they want to know. They just want to know who they are, and they want to know their story. And most of the time, uh, when you get into reunion, and not everybody wants to be reunited. I was thrilled. I have a wonderful son, and I always wondered where he was, how he was doing, and all of that. But I, he finally, like Tina, he was finally able to get his story, get his medical information, and I, I, I hope it put his pieces together. It just mends so many hearts. But sometimes when a birth mother and an adoptee get together, it, it's not always so good. For some reason, and a, a lot of times uh, the adoptive parent um, feel very betrayed if their adoptee uh, wants to find their birth parents. They think, well, you know, I gave you everything. Right. But um, so a lot of adoptees do not look for their birth parents until their adoptive parents may have passed away because it's very, very traumatic. So the grief and the trauma, it just goes on forever. And even after you are reunited, if it's good or bad, then you grieve all the years that you weren't able to be together. I mean, it's good and you can go from this point on, but gosh, what all did, what all did we miss? You know, Pat, you, you're an incredible woman because twice now you have answered my question before I asked it. I was just going to ask you, since you have been reunited, did that remove your grief? And the answer is no, because now you have a new layer of grief and that's for all the years you could have had with this wonderful, wonderful young man that you didn't get to experience. Again, thank you. Tina, I'm coming around the circle again. <laughs> I want to ask, we've met, we've heard her, you guys have said many times that the father is not normally included in there. Do you think this is something that's going to change? And would you like to know, for example, more about your dad? Oh, yes. I, well, whether it will change or not, I don't know. I, I'm not that up on the current laws in all of the states. It's not it, because there's no federal law. It's state by state. What happens with uh, original birth certificates and adoption records. I've always wanted to know who he was. And I uh, searched and searched the first time I met my birth mother when I was um, 19. She told me one thing. She gave me a name and told me this story about how she had been in Colorado. She got pregnant. She was with a married guy. And then she came back to Minnesota and never told him about me. So that was story number one. Years later, this was after I had my own children, uh, she said that that was not true, that it was a rape, and that she could not give me a name. So... I I have been searching for that missing piece for years and years. What's interesting is recently on Ancestry, 
I have had DNA hits that uh, I have a half sister on Ancestry. And so we have different mothers, but the same father. And it coincides with the region that my birth mother told me she was living in. Uh, he, I believe I have him narrowed down. I have contacted first cousins through Ancestry. And I've tried to piece together through family trees who this guy is. And I believe I have him narrowed down, either him or a brother, I believe. And so I'm in the process of recontacting some of those first and second cousins and trying to pinpoint what happened to this man. I know he died in 2008, but what his life was, if they knew him. One of them said he had met him when he was a little child, but he really didn't remember him. And so that search continues. And if his name is on the birth record, I will be so surprised. I, I can't even imagine that that will happen. But I continue to search for that, that piece because that's 50% of my DNA. And wow. I just want to know. Again, yeah. it's, not about, it's not about making a connection. I know he's passed away, but it's about, it's about putting that piece of the puzzle in and just being able to say, hey, okay, I know yeah. this. I yeah. know this. I know this about who I am. Absolutely. And my daughter, uh, Sophie, is very interested, not so much because of the, the biological stuff, because she said, you know, we've always lived with that being a big question mark. But she's just interested because she's interested in genealogy. Nice. And she said, there's always this this piece that I can't I can't right. put in. And so it you know, again, it's an ongoing game. Every time I feel like I hit a dead end with the DNA, yeah, I grieve. <clears throat> yep. And so I continue to grieve for that, and I continue to grieve for what if he had known? What right. if I, what if she had told him and he knew about me? Right. Um. So it just goes on and on and on. It does. Well, good luck in finding resolution to that. Thank you, Vera. You said that on the cert birth certificate you have for your daughters, it does list the father's name. Do your daughters have any interest in their fathers? Uh, no. If it's any, if they ever talk about it, it's always the birth mom. I think okay. it's because, you know, that's, I don't know if that's how they associate things, that they were in okay. somebody's body. I don't know. Um, okay. But, you know, one of the things... I think is really important for adoptive parents to understand is that the kids, their development is kind of all over the place and they, they, they right. do some the strangest things and that it's normal <laughs> because they are, it's affected. The grief is affecting everything, you know? So like the other day, I, <laughs> you know, one of my daughters suddenly asked about something about her birth book, you know, and I was like, Hey, I've always had this out, you know, and that she came over and we looked at it. She's like, I've never seen this in my life. And she was like, huh. angry kind of about it. I'm like, and my husband's like, Oh, geez, honey, you know, <laughs> we've <been laughs> had this around forever. Like we tried for, you know, right. and so not take it personally that, you know, that, that's right. that anger that kind of, that comes out, you know, and, the, and, and, you know, we took, my husband took, extensive notes of our trip to Russia. I mean, a journal. Mm -hmm. He like typed it out for him. He gave it to him and he put something in there like on purpose that would be really embarrassing just to see if yeah. they had read it. <laughs> it was something about me. And he's like, I know they never yeah. read it because they would have jumped all over that. So like, you know, yeah. it's like you try, but again, it's like when they're ready and they will, they will ask when they ask it. And, you know, Pat, I'm just wondering right now, about what that's, what's like for you to hear. I just, I wonder like sometimes if, when you hear birth parents and the struggles they have and, and the adoptive children, the struggles they have, if you, if you, if that adds like a, another layer of grief for you or, or something, because I feel bad because I know that that wasn't something you planned on at all to, to be pregnant or whatever. And if this is hard to hear how they struggle, like how a lot of them struggle is, I don't, I just, I'm curious what that's like for you. Well, I have to think about that. You know, I guess I always felt, I, I hoped that the parents that uh, my child got was going to, you know, treat him well and give him the life I wasn't going to be able to give him at the time. And that there would be a mom and a dad and, you know, everything would be okay. So 
everybody expects the adoptive family to be this perfect family. And we find out that wasn't always the case for adopt. They didn't get the perfect family. But the bottom line is, there is no perfect family, even with your biological kid. You know, it, there is no right. perfect family. Right. So, um, and you're, I think as birth parents, probably you're always jealous, maybe, of the adoptive family because they got the privilege that you gave them. And uh, so, but it's real hard. I think international adoption for adoptive parents may be different than the domestic because um, that's different. If, if it's a domestic, you know, more than likely the adoptee and the adoptive parents are in the state. And that's a whole different thing, you know, getting your records, getting your adoption records versus your international. That would, that would be completely different. I would think for the adoptee as well, but this, the bottom, the same thing happens though with the adopt the adoptee. They still grieve the loss of their birth parent, regardless. It's it's just something they want, and they 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 want to know that. Maybe not everyone, but I think a lot of them do. Interesting, interesting. Do any of you have a question you'd like to ask one of the other points of the triad before I wrap up? Uh, I'd like to ask Pat. Uh, she and I were in a discussion board or a, uh, a Zoom. Was that last week or two weeks ago, Pat? The I think Cub. two weeks ago. I, can't I don't remember. remember. <laughs> okay. So I was I was invited to join the Zoom for Concern United Birth Parents, and I did that, and uh, it was... It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience because I was able to listen to other birth parents talk about their experiences. And I also got to hear from Joe. Oh, Joe. What was his name? Joe. Joe. Joel Joe or Joe? Okay. So I heard from Joe, who is also an adoptee, and he has gone through research and reunion. And he said something that really resonated with me. Um, we were, I, I can't remember what we were talking about specifically, but he said something about, that's the reason that I come here. And he was talking about maybe the, one of the, one of the birth moms had said something like, well, you know, we're happy to have you here or, or you belong here or something like that. And the way he responded that he just felt like he was being mothered by these birth moms. Oh. It just, it, I mean, I cried afterwards. I just cried because it felt so healing for an adopted child to, he especially one who's had a bad reunion, right. to hear that these are mothers who are here for us and they understand what we've gone through because they've been through it as well. And that just really hit me hard. And I wondered if Pat had any comments about well, that. Well, we do have a support group once a month. And we meet for the most part in person. And the in-person meetings are so wonderful because you actually get to hug each other, you know, that type of thing. And everybody <laughs> goes around and just gives an update as to what is going on in their life. And it can be about anything, and, and we'd love for the adoptees to come. Because as birth parents, we learn as much from the adoptee. And if adoptive parents are invited as well, we don't have as many that come. But if everybody in the triad is there, it just helps you understand your feelings and what everything is going on in your life. And it is all. Everybody's still grieving and that's kind of why we're we're there mm -hmm. and but giving each other hope the adoptees whoever's and, yeah so and that's a group of friends that I have made because I started attending the we call it the cup group concerned united birth parents which is a national organization for birth parents but it also includes the adoptees but okay. you know you get there everybody's watched watched your path everybody understands because everybody has been there. We don't have to explain anything and everybody's so supportive. It sounds wonderful. Sounds like a great opportunity to help you heal in your grief. Any other questions before I wrap up? I, I would say, Pat, it would be interesting. Um, you know, you say birth uh, adoptive parents don't show up 
very much. And I can see why, but I wonder if that would be something to grow in the triad, because I can totally see why, why we wouldn't want to grow. Um, why, why do you say that, I Sarah? think because our struggle is just seems like it's kind of weird, like it's out here a little bit. And I can see how that ne- those fences need to be mended. I would love to get more involved in that in a way to bring adopted parents more in because I because we struggle alone because so many people don't understand at all what we're going through. Um, but this these two pieces could really help heal that. So yeah, an interesting Vera. Do you Vera? Do you think any of the struggle is based on the fact that you are since you have the adopted children with you and you see their struggles and their feelings and emotions, and their hurt right. many times, that it's based more on you not wanting to interfere? No, it's not that. It's, no? It's, okay. it's, you know, when they talk about how they get each other, I think that's okay. really cool. And it would be nice to bring that into the adoptive parent part, because we're all, we don't have any of that connection that the birth okay. parent can you know, and the adoptee could say, well, so right. there are no, there are no support groups oh, yeah. for adoptive parents. Oh, here. there are, but not with you guys. Oh, I see. I there, see. Yes, there are, but there's oh. probably not enough. But what I'm saying, the triad, the triad that we're bringing together right now, it would be cool to have more because I was just so struck when Pat said adoptive parents don't really show up and I can see exactly why. And, and that's, Interesting. interesting this triad how can how could we help heal that i think it would help adoptive parents something to understand probably more yes. what every what the birth parent is going through and maybe that would explain some of the uh issues with the children they're trying to raise exactly everyone is so with adopt it is such as um you're out there trying to figure it out by yourselves instead of being involved in the triad is what i think is going on um because adoptive parents yeah, feel alone and, right and vera and i have run a couple of workshops yes. and one that i remember we we met with adolescent adoptees. And I had done a ton of research on developmental issues and just how adolescents might be affected by adoption. And uh, the parents there that came to the workshop were so hungry for that information and so grateful to have it that I, I just would love to keep doing more of that because I think anytime any member of the triad gains information, it can help in just more understanding, more dialogue. And I think it's so important. There, there may be a new concept being born I here at this very so. moment. I was really you've got, yep. you've got a complete triad yep. here. There's no reason that the three of you, who also are geographically nearby, right. mm-hmm. You could start something, and it could be the start of. Something. I don't think adoptive parents sometimes wow. understand the biological connection that the children will always have to their birth parent, even if they were adopted yes. as children. Mm-hmm. The basic connection is never severed, mm-hmm. even though they may have been separated and put someplace right. else. That biological connection right. is always there. Right. And, and wouldn't that be nice to bring the adoptive parent into that, that, that triad of that? Well, the purpose of open adoption is supposed to be helping some of that, you know, where the, you have the open adoptions versus the closed adoptions, where the, there's supposed to be open communication between the adoptive parent and the child and so the child will always know who their birth parents is are you know from the very beginning but that doesn't always work either but it it's supposed to have made things easier for adoptive parents but i'm not sure it's still pretty new wow wow it is it is okay well i fear the time has come ladies that i have to wrap up and uh tie a little knot around this and say, who knows, more to come another time? Is there a part three? (laughs) We'll have to decide that. But for right now, to each of you, Pat, Vera, Tina, I want to say thanks for joining me today. This has been 
a truly wonderful and rewarding discussion from my perspective, because I have insight that I probably would not ever have gained had this group gotten together. So thank you, each of you, for that. I'm going to wrap up and say to our listeners, thank you also for tuning in today. I know we run a little longer than usual, but I think it was really, really important to hear everything that was said. Today serves as a perfect example that Not all grief is related to the death of someone you love, but sometimes it's just related to a loss. In the case of adoption, it's loss, as Tina put it, in so many layers from so many perspectives. It certainly supports the concept that grief is totally unique for every single person, and even for that person, that has multiple instances of grief, every instance of a loss is different grief. The more and more I dig into the topic of grief, the more and more I realize that we have sold ourselves short, people, because grief is present in our daily lives. We may just not acknowledge it as such. And the quicker we learn to acknowledge it, for what it is, the quicker we try to take care of ourselves and help ourselves get through these losses in a healthy way, wow, we're going to do so much better. We're going to be so much healthier physically, emotionally, and mentally. So on that note, thanks everyone involved today, my guests, my listeners, everyone for supporting us. And please join again next time as we all continue to live and grieve. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.